Hi, this is Bob Sorrentino from Italian Roots and Genealogy, and I'm here today with Michael Fattorossi. Uh, and um, we're going to talk about his family and also about the book that he wrote, Resurrection of the Scrolls. So uh, welcome, Michael. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I really do. Your, your book is based loosely or maybe a lot around your family history. Is that right? Well, the, yes and no. I mean, it's it's historical fiction, but it's um, it's very interesting because I was able to to take something from I, I've been able to take a lot of things from the actual family history and feed it into the book. As you read the book, um, there are certain flashback chapters uh, in the book, and those flash those flashback chapters are actual uh, historical fact. Uh, as far as the family history, it, you know, always embellished a little bit, but yes. So yeah, that's, that's kind of what my research brought me to was to kind of create a fictional book uh, wrapped around some historical fiction, uh, historical fact, sorry. Uh, no. So that's, so that's pretty cool. So, so, you know, when did you get started with researching uh, the family? When did you get the bug? Well, it was, and this is where I told you, it's an interesting story because I never knew anything about my family history. Nobody in my family knew anything about the family history. And what happened was, is when I was 21, um, I, I'm also from New Jersey, by the way. I, oh, I, grew up, I, I grew up in Woodbridge, not too far from you. And my father passed away when I was 21 from cancer. And at his funeral um, was his uncle, my great uncle, uh, Uncle Billy, as we called him. And Uncle Billy, I said to him, I go, what do you know about the family? What, I mean, do you know anything about where the Fatarosis came from? And he said very little, Michael. He goes, uh, you know, all I know is that they were from a wealthier family and they were a lot of artists and musicians. And I think they were from a town called Grignano. So I took out a little like napkin and I wrote down Grignano on it and I had him spell it and I put it in my pocket. And I forgot about it. And I just kept the napkin, you know, tucked away in my house. Maybe someday I would do anything with it. I didn't know. And fast forward about uh, 12, 13 years, uh, I'm in Italy with my first wife. And she had planned a trip for us to kind of do the, the Italy, you know, down the boot kind of trip. We started in Venice and then we went to Florence and then we did Rome and then <clears throat> she put uh, Positano as the last part of the trip. And so we're sitting in the hotel room in Positano and it's raining and it's, we only have like three or four days in Positano and she's really mad because, you know, there's nothing to do. So I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the like local magazines that, you know, you get in every hotel room. They always put out these books and these magazines. So I'm just flipping through them and there's a map of the area. And on the map, it says Grignano. And I'm like, what? We, I, and literally, when you look it on the map, Grignano and, and Positano are so close. The only problem is there's a mountain range between them. So to get to Grignano, you have to go all the way around the Sorrento Peninsula and then mm. come back inland. But I didn't know that. So I'm like, look how close we are. We're like, <laughs> it's right there. I have to go. And she's like, no, tomorrow's supposed to be nice. We're, we have to go to Capri. We haven't seen Capri. I'm like, I'm this close to the town that my family is from. I have to go there. And we argued all night. So the next morning we wake up and I had to hire a driver who also spoke English. And so I hired a driver and she's telling me, oh, this is a waste of time. You're not going to find anything. We should be spending the last day of our vacation in Capri. And I was like, listen, if you want to go to Capri, here's some money, take a boat. It takes you right to Capri, have a nice lunch, do your shopping. I'm doing this for me. I have to do this. So she's like, no, no, I'm going to come. And I'm just like, oh, this is going to be such a horrendous trip for me. Because, <laughs> you know, in my ear, the whole, I told you, you weren't going to find anything. I told you this was a waste of time. So the driver goes, where do you want to go? And I said, Grignano. And he looks at me because Positano is absolutely beautiful. I mean, it's like one of the most picturesque places in Italy. And Grignano is kind of run down. It's, 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 you know, it's a real Italian city. It's not tourism. They don't have tourists there. And uh, it's what real Italy is. And so he goes, why do you want to leave Positano and go to Grignano? I said, family research. He goes, oh, okay, I understand. So then we're driving, and, he, and for some reason, he goes, you know, instead of going to Grignano, why don't we go to Lettity? I said, Lettity? 
He goes, yeah, Letity. It's an older town. It's further up the mountain, but they'll have older records. And, and for whatever reason, I said, okay. And I'm not usually a guy that says, okay, when you're changing my plans. Like, I, I don't know why I said, okay. I, I still, to this day, it, if you had to ask me again, a thousand times out of a thousand times, I would have said, no, let's go to Grignano. This time I said, yes. So we drive up to Letity and we stop at the little uh, town hall, the, the, the uh, mun municipal hall. And he goes inside and we go inside and he tells the guy behind the desk, like, oh, I've got Americans here. They're doing family research. So the guy behind the desk goes, OK, well, what's the last name? And he goes, Fattarosi. The guy looks and he like looks around my driver and kind of points to me and he goes, Fattarosi. He goes, see, si, Fattarosi. He goes, no, no, no go across the street to the cathedral, they have older records. Okay, so we walk across the street to the cathedral, we walk inside, the priest comes out. Now this time the priest looks at me and goes, Passaporto, Passaporto. So I give him my passport and he goes, Fatorosi. So he takes me off to the side and on a big plaque, there are all these names of the bishops of Letity since the 900s through I think the 1800s when they lost the bishop seat. And in 1428 to 1440 is the name Factorosa. Factoro. And I said, no, 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 not Factorosa, Factorosi. And he goes, no, 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 same family, just a change in spelling. I said, really? He goes, yes. And I said, a Factorosi was bishop of this cathedral? And he goes, no, no, not this cathedral, the old cathedral. So then he walks me outside and across the way, you could see it from the from this cathedral is an old castle, a huge old Norman castle in Letity. And next to that is the ruins of the old cathedral that date back to the year 1000. And they stopped using that cathedral in about the 15 or 1600s. And so my ancestor, well, not ancestor, because he probably didn't have children, but someone in the Fatorosi family was Bishop of Letity between 1400, I mean, 1428 and 1440. And then he takes me around to another plaque and another plaque on the wall in one of the little alcoves. And it's dedicated to Michael Factorosius, spelled the old Latin way. The Latin, yeah. And Michael, and I'm like, you know, oh my God. And I'm like, this is, and he's like, well, Michael is buried below the church. This used to be over his body, but because it had been walked on so much, it was removed from the floor and put on the wall. And that was dated like 1704. So now I'm like, oh my God. And he goes, well, wait here for a minute. He walks down, Steve, he walks out to the, to the priest's little office and he brings back a book. Hold on, I'll get it. So he walks upstairs and he brings back this book, okay? And this is basically the history of the churches in Letity. It was written in 1978 by a priest. And so I start, I start you know, thumbing through the book until I get to this page, hold on. Which I don't know if you can see it, but yeah. it's, it's a family tree sort of, of the Fatorosi and the Fatorosi de Barnaba families from 1428 to 1891, which is when my great grandfather left and came to America. So I'm sitting here and I'm looking at this book and I'm going, you know, I can't read it. It's in Italian. I don't speak Italian. I didn't read Italian. But he said, well, for a, a donation, I'll let you keep the book. I said, okay, <laughs> here's your donation. I'm keeping the book. And, you know, I think I had the most satisfying day of my, of any married man's life when you could turn to your wife and go, ha ha, <laughs> see, look, this was not a waste of time. Look at what I discovered. And so I took this book. So this book was written off based upon a book called the Codis Fatorosi. And the Codis Fatorosi was written in the 14, 15, 1600s. It was sort of a history of Letity. And it was written by several different ancestors over time. They kept adding to it. So the, the, this priest, uh, Luigi Grazzi, borrowed that book from my family who still had it in Letity, and he used that book to basically write this book. So if you go through it, there's all of these references to Codis Fatorosi. Well, that started, this started the book. So 
then I had to find Codis Vatarosi and I had to discover all of this stuff. So I started having um, uh, researchers translate this for me. So I translated most of this book into English so I could understand it. And then from there, that brought me to other books. And then finally, I found the Codis Vatarosi. So this is a scan of the actual Codis. And it took me 13 years to find this because it was being hidden. Because what happened was it was taken from the Fatarosi family in Letity and it was never returned. It was supposed to be returned after the, after the priest had written his book, but instead the priest gave it to the uh, bishop in Castellamare where this, the original Codis Fatarosi now sits in their vault. But I tracked it down and I forced them to give me a scanned copy of it, which they did do. And so this then fueled even more research. And then I started having the researchers uh, translate this book, which was not easy because it's in Italian, part of it's in Spanish a little bit, part of it's in French, part of it's in Latin, because it's written over several hundred years. And Italy was conquered by a lot of different people from the time it was started to the time it was finished. So all of those languages kind of got brought into the CODIS. And that spurred me to even more research. And then I was able to track the original family um, uh, to the uh, 11th century in Salerno. So uh, Fattorosi used to be Factorosa, and Factorosa, uh, there are uh, records from um, an abbey in Cava de Terni where the Factorosa family had donated land and buildings within Salerno uh, to the abbey. So, you know, their, their immortal souls will be forever allowed into heaven. Okay. And so from Salerno, I tracked the family using the same type of documents, because really back then, those are the only documents that you can really find is the church. The church wrote everything down because they didn't want somebody coming back later and saying, hey, you have our land. So everything, every, every donation that was made was written down by the church, was put into a land grant, and it was sworn on by witnesses. So you can never get your land back once you gave it to the church. And they kept all these records. And so they're perfect. They're perfect ways to track. So I was able to track the Factorosa family from Salerno. Then they moved into Rivalo, Rivello, and then from Rivello into Letity. And they moved into Letity around 1139. So between 100 years, they basically went from Salerno to Letity. And they just kind of moved up the, the coast of Sorrento. And that's where the family had been for eight, 900 years. And so, you know, nobody in our family are, are counts or dukes or anybody really important, but they married into a lot of important families. So I always like to tell, because people ask me like, oh, you're a noble family. I'd be like, yeah, we're a noble family, but we're not, we're not the highest noble family. We're kind of the one step down from those noble families. Like there was an important Fatarosi that was governor of the castle in Letity. And another ancestor was governor of another castle in, 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 in Italy. So they were always kind of like one step below the counts. They were advisors. Uh, they were attorneys. A lot of times uh, there were Fatarosi women that married into the families of counts. Um, but we, we never got to that level of being a count. So I always say to people that we were the lesser nobles. We were one step above the peasants and one step below the counts and the dukes and you know, three steps below the, the kings and the queens. But it's been an interesting, I've been doing this now for 16 years. It, it's been fascinating uh, being able to trace all of this back. And I think I've been able to trace the very beginnings of the family down to Calabria. And I think, and I, I can't be sure of this because there's just no way to prove it. But I do know that the name Fatarosi comes from a name called Factorosa. And Factorosa was a female's name who was Lombard. And so that would have been a, a woman's first name. And for whatever reason, there was a man who decided to call himself uh, Giovanni de Factorosa, as opposed to naming himself after his father. 
Because usually in these societies, you know, the, it's the male lineage that counts. But for whatever reason, Giovanni decided, and I can only assume it's because his mother may have been a powerful person or an important person, and his father wasn't. And so he wanted to be known as the son of this mother, as opposed to being the son of the father. And the only reason why I could think that's possible is because the family starts around the time of the Norman invasion of Southern Italy. And my guess is that the male line is French Norman. And if, if, I, if you look at my crest, it's got five fleur-de-lis. So that represents the, the Norman influence. And the Factorosa, the woman, was a Lombard, and that's represented by the lion on the crest. And so what happened was, is, you know, I, there was a man who came over with the Normans who may have been a knight, he may have been a soldier, he may have been somebody, I don't know who he is. And he married into a powerful Lombard family and had children, because that's what a lot of the, the Normans did back then, is that, you know, they, they assimilated into the culture of Southern Italy by marrying into the noble uh, Lombard families. And I think that's what happened. And because of the, the female line being more noble and no one really knowing who the father is, Giovanni de Factorosa took his mother's name. And, and Giovanni is a name that's been passed down in my family for a thousand years. My, my fathers and uncles are Joseph and John and John and Joseph. So it's an ongoing name in the family. So, you know, in a nutshell, that's, that's been my research for the past 16 years and many trips back and forth to Italy, lots of money spent on translators and travel. Yeah, yeah I bet. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I just got back from, um, from Italy uh, last week. And most of the time that I spent a month there, most of the time that I spent, I was scanning records. So one of my ancestors was Paolo Factorosa, or pa actually his name is Factorosi, Paolo Factorosi. He's one of the authors of this, of the Codis. He was one of the Fatorosis that wrote part of it. He was an attorney. And so uh, all of his records from him being a notary in Lettity are housed in the, in the Naples archives. So I went there and I scanned something like, uh, I don't know, four or 5,000 pages of his records. And it was, wow. just, so, it was just so awesome to, to sit there and hold the books that he had personally written everything down on, knowing that here I am 500, 400 years later, looking at his work as an attorney, and I, I'm an attorney. And I, I thought I was the first attorney in my family because I grew up very poor in America. My father was not wealthy. My father drove trucks. You know, he worked in warehouses. So I always thought I was the first one to become a lawyer. And then by discovering this, I realized, oh, I'm probably the 20th or 30th <laughs> lawyer in the family. And, it, and it's, it's just a career that kind of gets passed down throughout the, the history of the family. So it makes me scratch my head and go, I, I wonder if there's something genetic here about being a lawyer. And it just gets kind of like passed down in the family because it's, it's genetics. I don't know. Uh, well, you know, I mean, that's a fascinating story, the, the fact that you were able to find all of that out. But, you know, the reason that you wound up in Lettere was because either he or some other ancestor said, no, you need to go here. Yeah, you because know, they want to be found. They want yeah. to be found. And, and, that, and, and that was always my ex-wife's theory, is that, that there was too many coincidences. Yep in this and that it's kind of been guide that I've been kind of been guided along the way to this point. And I, I, sir, I do not doubt that because there, if I would have went to Grignano, because I've gone to Grignano since going to Lettity, there's no trace. There's nothing, of there, right? there's nothing there. If I would have went to Grignano, my wife would have gotten the better of me. She would have <laughs> laughed. She would have told me what a waste of money it is. And I would not be talking to you now because I would have went home and said, oh, we were probably peasants and, you know, never would have done any more research. And so, you know, this, that one discovery changed my life. It, it, you know, I'm now living in Rotterdam. I'm living in Europe so I can get to Italy faster um, to do more research instead of trying to fly back and forth because I was living in Las Vegas and it's a... It's a bear of a trip to get there. Right. And here I just, you know, two hours, I can fly back and down in, in a weekend if I need to. So it, it kind of like changed the, the course of my life. 
And so, so yeah. So you you've you've become thoroughly obsessed. I would say so. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's it's a matter of. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I I'm obsessed to the point of where it's 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 the last part of my life. So you know, you you have these stages in life. And, you know, 20 to, and I'm 52, so 25 to 50, it was all about my career. And so now, you know, from 50 to whenever I, I pass, this is going to be the work that I concentrate on. But it's not only this, it's not only about my family, because now I've gone beyond that. Now I look at it as I want to help other people find their roots. So one of the other things that I did when I was in Letteri is not only did I scan the records of Paolo Fatorossi, I went in and I got permission from the, the priests in Letity, and I scanned all of the records of all of the churches in Letity, 10 churches from the years 1600 to 1800. And so I'm going to make those available on my website. So anyone else whose family is from Letity can do this research. They can find the information about their relatives or even the people who still live in Letity. The one thing that I noticed about Italians too is though, even though they live in the same town as their ancestors, they don't know more than maybe two or three generations either. No, they like, don't. No, they don't. Like what, one of the interesting things is when I was back in Letity, there is a woman that I met online and we started talking and uh, her name is Philly. I won't give you her last name because I don't want people looking her up, but she's younger. And we started talking online. And then all of a sudden she started talking to her uncle and she found out that that her great great grandmother was Fatarosi. Hmm. So she ends up becoming a relative. And she never knew that. She never knew. And then we did more research when I was there and found and found out that not only was her great great grandmother a Fatarosi, but her great great grandmother bought the land where her father has the winery now. So, you know, there's all of these little interesting things that you find when you start asking questions. And you start, you know, looking at relatives and you start talking to them about what they re what they may remember. And so I just want people to, to know their past, to know their history, because that's what I told her. I said, you know, I said, you come from a noble family. She goes, no, we're not noble. And I said, you have to be noble, because if your great great grandfather married into my family, knowing that my family was noble, you had to be noble because back then people didn't get married just for love. That's right. There had to be, there had to be, you know, an equal footing of the families for them to allow such a marriage. You wouldn't have allowed your noble daughter to marry a peasant uh, man. So they had to be noble. And so when I did more research, yeah, I found out that her family goes back a thousand years too. And she didn't know that. So, I mean, you know, it's not just about me anymore. It's about bringing more people into the fold. Um, I've also created a group where I'm trying to get the immigrants um, of people, uh, the, 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 the families, the descendants of those who left Letity and went to America. I'm trying to get them together. I created a Friends of Letity group. And really what this is all about, what it's mostly about is helping Letity. Letity is a wonderful little town. It's got 6,000 people. It's got this beautiful castle that they, that's been restored a thousand year old castle. It's got uh, some ruins next to it that date back to Roman times. And it sits right between Sorrento and Pompeii. And, you know, Pompeii gets three to five million visitors a year. Hmm. Letity with this beautiful castle. And, you, and as you drive, you know, you can see the castle from the highway because it, it's so prominent, but they get zero tourism. And so one of the one of the big reasons why I'm doing this is to also, and what I'm going to do next year now that COVID is over, is I'm going to start tours to Letity, where people, where I, well, I'll, you know, have a bus bring them up to the castle and we can do tours and do lunches. And really what's nice about Letity, as opposed to some of the other towns in the area, is it has that authentic Italian feel or that, that old Italy feel. You know, I don't, we're, we're, I'm sure you've been all over the place in Italy, but if you go to the tourist areas, you know, they're very whitewashed. They're very kind of pretty and pristine. And, you know, they've driven the, the locals out and they've all been replaced by tourist areas. And I, I like to refer to them as tourist traps. 
The food isn't authentic. You know, the people that are working there aren't from the town. So that's one of the things I like about Letity is that it still has that that romance of real Italy. Like people are still putting their laundry up on lines outside their house. And the old men are still meeting in the town square playing pinochle, you know, as they drink wine that they made on their farms out of jugs. And that's only that you're only going to see that in a town like Letzvi. You're not going to see that in Sorrento. You're not going to see that in Amalfi. You're not going to see that in Ravello because those are all major tourist attractions now. Yeah. And, and um, funny, interesting that you mentioned that because I'm working, we're a little bit behind schedule, but I'm working with a couple of people over there to kind of do exactly what you're talking about. The Italian, we, we're calling it the Italian experience. So mm-hmm. to, to get to know Italy, like an Italian, as opposed to going to the tourist places. Yeah, and yeah. and I'll you know I'll have to invite you to that so you could kind of see what we're doing. I would um, like but it, interesting thing about attorneys. I never knew this, and again, my family, my grandparents were older, and I never really talked to my grand. My grandfather died when I was uh, a baby, and I never really asked my grandmother. And she spoke mostly only Italian anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in my research, I found out that my. Uh, my on my uh, father's father's side, uh, that my great grandfather was an attorney, which oh. I, nobody ever knew. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he became an attorney, or either he became an attorney or he was, you know, studying quote unquote, you know, as much as you could in the, the mid 1800s. Um, you know, or, he, or maybe he was, um, <clears throat> I guess he was working for an attorney, and his wife. Her father and his father were attorneys. Her whole family were attorneys. Yeah. Right. And eventually, my grandfather, my great grandfather, Achilles Sorrentino, and I found this out from a newspaper in New Jersey, believe it or not, from the 1920s, that he was a Supreme Court justice in Naples, probably really? in the, the, the 18, 1910 through 1925 or something like that. So, really? Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> shocking. Yes, I mean your you, your last name is Sorrentino, which is very indicative of the Naples area. That that's a family that's that's kind. There's a lot of Sorrentinos in Letity too. It's really? a it, oh yes, oh there's a ton of Sorrentinos. Yeah, oh, that's yeah, interesting. Man, one of the fir- one of the one of the noble families of Letity was Sorrentino, and one of the Sorrentinos um, back in the 1400s was crown was made uh, by the French king a knight. So the Sorrentinos are still in Letity and they've been in Letity for 600 years. Yes, yeah, so you know, and, and, and in my grandparents' case, my, my grandmother was from two extremely noble families, one more noble than the other. Uh, and she married my grandfather who, you know, as far as I know, at the, you know, in the 1800s, he was not from a noble family, but they, they had enough status <clears throat> that I guess it was okay, you know, I mean, the the the, uh, the nobility and stuff of that were gone, and I guess yeah. they probably had money. Yeah. So that was probably a big factor in in all of that too. But you know, same thing like you mentioned with the, the names going back to uh, you know your the one thousand. My grandmother's father, uh, his their, their family name is Piermalo. And I was going nuts trying to find them. I knew that there was only one Piermalo family, but when I found the records on the, on the um, Libra di Oro and the nobility of Naples, I did not see any of their names. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I couldn't figure it out. My third great grandmother was the Duchess and she, her, she had, there were no male relatives. So she was able to get the, the title Duchess after mm-hmm. her brother died. Mm-hmm. Her last name was Capici Piccicelli. What is it? Capici Piccicelli. Wow. That's two, and that's, and that, yeah, and that's a combination of two noble families, Capici yeah. and Piccicelli, going mm-hmm. back thousands of years. Uh, now, so I'm doing this research and I find her and I find her son and I don't see her other son's daughters. I know they're all there. I see the, I have the records and I can't figure this out. Well, what happened was, and I thought the Duchess changed her name, but I just found something just a few days ago. The the son, the heir, when he got the title, he merged all three names, Piermalo, Capici, Piccicelli, 
because Capici Picicelli was more noble than Pier Malo. Mm-hmm. And he didn't want to lose that. Yes. Yeah, it, it's it, it it's like putting it. I You know, it's funny. I never liked jigsaw puzzles. Never did. Never <laughs> did them as a kid. Hated them. But this is like the most interesting jigsaw puzzle that you could ever do. And it's the same thing that I found. It's like you you hit these 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 dead ends. Yes. And you don't know. And then all of a sudden something pops up, a record pops up somewhere that fills in the blank and you're allowed and you could put that piece together and put that part of the puzzle. And then you move on to the next piece. That's what I found this to be very much like. Yeah. I, yeah. And, and again, going back to what we said before, it's because they want to be found. You know, yeah. same thing happened with me. I, I, um, this one family, Deriso, uh, that, she married into the, the Dukes of Capricota and I couldn't find anything on this Deriso, nothing. Didn't know who anybody was. So I did something with uh, a family search. I did one of their online consultations. And if anybody listening, family search is totally free and they give you a free online consultation and they really help you find stuff. Yeah, well, they came, good. yeah. And they came across the will mm-hmm. of Gaspari Deriso who was the uncle of my fourth great-grandmother. This will is 43 pages, all in Italian. (laughs) I had somebody translate it for me. And Mm -hmm. he left his entire fortune to my fourth great-grandmother. Wow. And again, you know, with the records, with a record like that, you, 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 it's not just a a fact on a piece of paper. You actually get to know what the, the person was thinking. See, it's interesting because, and, and by the way, Doriso is another family from Lettity. So really another surname that's found in Lettity. Yes. Um, for me, what's really odd about all of this is that I've got so many records from 14 to 16 to 1700s. As we get into the 1800s, it's been really hard for me to find stuff. Like I, I tried to do the Italian citizenship through blood. And even in New York, my uh, my great grand my my grandfather's records were missing. They did not have a birth certificate for him. I have not been able to track down the birth certificates for my great great grandfather. And you know, it's now that I'm here, it's, it'll be a lot easier because I'll spend more time in Italy. But one of the most aggravating things I think is that when I started doing this. I was trying to find the birth stuff so I could get the dual citizenship. And I sent out letters to every church. I probably sent 20 letters out written in Italian with a check. I I included like $10 just to like get their interest. Zero response. All of the priests cashed my check and none of them bothered to even email me back. (laughs) And so I've gone there and this is, and this is part of the problem, you know, for, for, for your visitors. It's sometimes, it's sometimes, it sometimes pays to hire people because churches close, records get moved. You know, so one of the things that I've learned about doing these records in Lentity is that, you know, there were 10 churches. Now there's only like six churches. So there's four churches that have closed. And when a church closes, the records may go to a local church or it may go back to the bishops. And so it's really hard if unless that church is still open is to find the records from 200 years ago because the church burnt down. It was destroyed in an earthquake. The records got moved to a different church. That church moved. So it takes a lot of time and effort to track some of these records down. It really does. And especially, I can't imagine finding a will like that. That's just incredible. Yeah, and that was, you know, like I said, that was kind of just through family search and, and uh, you know, they were able to, to pop up with it. But I, I you know, to, to your point, you know, things just popping up. I mean, I found some strangest things just, you know, on the internet, just poking around, you know, I found um, a book from the 1860s uh, from the Neapolitan army, list mm-hmm. of Neapolitan, ar- Neapolitan yeah. army officers. Mm-hmm. Um, and my uh, great-great-grandmother, uh, she was from Lucerne, Switzerland. Oh. I was like, I mean, first, why is this woman in Naples in the first place, right? How did they wind up, why did he wind up marrying somebody from Lucerne? And, and yeah, exactly. I never thought in a million years I would be able to find this woman. Um, well, I come across this, this record in Italy, and it shows that there was an Elisa Moore. Uh, her father was uh, 
Martino Moore from Lucerne. Okay, well, that's cool. I find this book, and in this book of Army officers is Captain uh, Martino Moore. He was uh, in the assigned to the Neapolitan Army from Lucerne. He was a uh, captain in the Swiss Guards mm-hmm. in Naples in, in the 1860s. Mm-hmm. Uh, look, I go a little bit down below, and I see Filippo Cracciolo, who is my second great grandfather. So now you start putting the pieces together and you say, okay, well, this guy, he's a young officer in the army, 21, 22 years old. There's this Bernardo Moore, 40 something years old. He probably had a young daughter. Yep. And that's how, (laughs) exactly. So so now I, I go back to the internet and I'm searching around for, you know, records in Lucerne, Switzerland. And I, this thing pops up and says, if you have any questions about the uh, uh, genealogy in Lucerne, Switzerland, write us in Italian, uh, German, or English, mm-hmm. and we'll try and help you out. I send an email, uh, and this guy sends me back a link that has um, all the family trees of the prominent uh, families in Lucerne, Switzerland, going back to 1300. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> and all of it, I didn't even have to go anywhere. <laughs> it was a yeah. middle of it. <laughs> but so that, but you know, that's what, you know, I, I try to tell people too, you know, don't get frustrated. Sometimes you just, you have to walk away. You do. Uh, yeah, exactly. There's a lot of times where you just have to close your computer and take a break and come back in a couple of weeks or co- I've done that. I've, I've just, you know, I've hit the walls and I've gotten so frustrated. I just said, okay, I'm taking, I'm taking a break. I'm walking away. And two or three months later, all of a sudden stuff pops up like the, that happened to me. And then what happened in those two or three months, there was a professor of history in Italy that specializes in the Norman period. And she had written a book about the Norman's influence on uh, Amalfi and Sorrento. And that's where I learned about all of this history that my family has in Rivallo uh, and how, like, you know, you talk about the will. In my family, there was uh, Stephanie Fatterosi, and she owned a villa next to Villa Ruffalo in uh, Ravello. And what she did was she, when she died, or before she died, she gave all of her possessions to the church. And wow. yeah, and so the very prominent family, and see, this is what annoys me too, is because the Fatterosi's were one of the founding families of Ravello, but they'd been forgotten there because she gave it all away. And that kind of erased the family from the town back in the 1600s. And while the, the other families continued to be there, so they were better remembered. But yeah, that just popped up because she had published a book on, um, oh, what is it, academia.eu? Or dot, at academia, that the, there's some great information on there as well. I have to, I have to check that out. I have to check that out. Yeah. That's where I found her book. She had written a paper, uh, as a professor and she published it on academia. Um, edu, edu, edu is your edu. And I did a search on my last name and there it was. And I was able to learn all about, uh, how the Federosis were prominent shipbuilders and ship owners in Amalfi and would trade around, uh, around uh, the Mediterranean. And that's why they moved to Letity because Letity was known for its chestnuts and for its wood that they would build ships out of. So the Fatorosis bought land in Letity, not intending to live there because in the 1400s, it was sort of like the wood outpost area that nobody lived. But I guess as fortune fell, they went to the land that they owned in Letity and started living there you know, full time. And that's where the family ended up. So it, yeah, you're right. It's it's you know it's funny that that you you make that connection with your ancestors and him being in the Naples Army. I sort of have an Al Capone story like that. I don't know if you want to hear it or not. Yeah, or yeah, that, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so I, I, I when I was living in Los Angeles, I met a guy, and uh, he was from Chicago, and his father uh, was uh, a mob boss in Des Moines, Iowa. Okay. And he was one of Al Capone's um, lieutenants or capos. 
And so Al Capone sent him to Des Moines, Iowa. And I, I asked, I asked my friend, I go, why Des Moines? He goes, well, Des Moines is a big trucking city. I said, oh, now I understand. So he grew up in Des Moines and his father was, uh, was a guy by the name of Lou Fratto, who was in the Kefar for hearings. And when he met me, he said, you know, Fatterosi, he's like, I know that name. I'm like, you know, he goes, do you have relatives in Chicago? And I was like, not that I know of. I know most of everybody. He's like, I've heard that name before. I know that name. I said, well, I, I don't know. And then as I was doing my research, what I found out was <clears throat> before coming to um, America, my great grandfather and great grandmother lived in Angli. And Angli is next to Letteri. It's the next town over. They touch. And Angli is where uh, Al Capone's mother is from. Mm. And so when I was doing the research in New York City, lo and behold, when my family lived in New York City, my great grandfather and great grandmother, they literally lived across the street from the Al, from Al Capone's parents. And the woman who uh, uh, notarized or witnessed my great uncle's birth certificate was the next door neighbor of Al Capone's parents. So I'm, again, there's no direct evidence, just like you have no direct evidence, but you kind of put two and two together and you start to say to yourself, well, you know, you've got two women who lived in Angli that are now 3000 miles away from their homes. They have children who are the exact same age because Al Capone was born the same year as my great, as my grandfather. And so, you know, on a nightly stroll around the streets of Brooklyn, I'm sure that they ran into each other and being from the same town, they must have been friendly. They must have talked. They must have known each other, even though I've got no proof that we knew the, the, the Capone family. But it would only make sense to me. That's how that happened. And that's how my friend ended up hearing about my name. So... Yeah, I wouldn't be the I wouldn't be the least bit, bit surprised because you know those it, it, they were so you know tightly knit back then and everybody oh, yeah. especially especially from the from the same towns. I mean, <laughs> I I have a similar thing in in Little Italy in New York where um, my my cousin's last name was Cusimano from Shaka, mm -hmm. Sicily, mm -hmm. um, and, and I I can't understand. I mean, my wife and my cousin's, uh, you know, my cousin's father, my uncle, they, they have to be related someplace, but they don't show up in the DNA, mm -hmm. but they have to be because they're from the same town. All the names are the same. There's Cusimano, there's Gilardi, there's all of these names. And they all, and they, they lived on Spring Street in Little Italy. Yes. So it's hard to imagine that they didn't have some sort of connection that they didn't exactly. know. And maybe even related, you know? Yeah. But this is what's great about this is because you can bring that out where people, you know, through their family stories, things get forgotten and you don't know why until, you know, like I, there's a part of my family that when I started doing the research, I reconnected with that was very close, but apparently in the 1950s, there was some argument over a gambling debt <laughs> <laughs> and they stopped talking to each other. And, you know, they, they just had, and they, before this, they would hang out, they would do all of these things. And then after this argument about a gambling debt, they never spoke to each other again. I didn't, I had cousins in my high school growing up that I didn't know who they were. I didn't know I was related to because wow. they, they, they had a different last name and they didn't know me because, you know, 30 years before the family argued and split and they never talked about each other again. But now since doing the research, I've been able to, to make friends with that side of the family and obviously, you know, reconnect. But yeah, that happens all the time. That happens all the time. Well, that's what happened with, with my cousin Linda and I. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a long story, but we basically found each other through ancestry. And we had no, and as far as we know, there was no arguments, but our families were connected for like 30 or 40 years because her great-great-grandmother and my grandmother uh, was, uh, I think it was her third great grandmother and my grandmother uh, were aunt and, and niece. Mm -hmm. And we never knew each other. And her grandmother's name was Beatrice Petix. And mm -hmm. my, I always remember when I was like about 10 years old, my parents saying we're going over to P P Texas and you know, what do I know? Um, but the funny part about it is I lived in Flushing 
um, about five or six blocks from her grandmother. Her aunt and her cousin lived in the same house with the grandmother. It was a two family house. Linda was there all the time. The same time I was living five blocks away for like five years. Mm -hmm. um, and when we were talking about the story, I said, you know, Linda, I kind of recall when we were going to look at the apartment and I got the apartment from my cousin mm -hmm. and Linda and her cousin used to go there. I had no mm -hmm. idea any of this, yeah. but, I, but I said, I said, you know, I kind of remember driving down Booth Memorial Avenue passing a house and my father saying, that's where Aunt Beatrice lives. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, I was 21 years old, getting ready to get married, you know, what I was, do not, right? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and then, but 50, almost 50 years later, boom. Yep. And you know, we connected and it was like, we knew each other our entire life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's I, I think this has been one of the most rewarding things in my life. The, one of the most rewarding things ever in my life, and I'm talking about from career to family or whatever, I was able to reunite a son with a mother. Um, what happened was, is there was, uh, in Italy, there was an affair between a young woman and an older man, which resulted in a pregnancy. And the family was not too happy with that. And so uh, she gave birth. And then after the birth, the son went to a um, to be raised by the nuns and to be put up for adoption. And so for the first couple of years, nobody adopted the boy. And then finally, when he turned about four or five, he was adopted by an Italian-American family. And he was taken to America and raised in California and um, had very, very little memory of his birth mom. I mean, you know three, four years old, you don't really remember much, doesn't, doesn't really remember anything. All he did was remember the name. And as I'm, I'm doing research, I come across an ad, wanted information on, and I'm, to protect everybody's privacy, I'm not using names, um, information on so-and-so. And so I wrote the person and I said, you know, why are you looking for this person? And I'm, you know, I think I may be related. I don't know if I am, but I think I may. And she told me the story. And I then wrote to a cousin that I met in uh, Italy through the research. And she said, yeah, that's my aunt. Wow. <laughs> that's my aunt. And so I said, well, her son's looking for her. And at first it, it was a little disturbing to the family because no one knew about this. Mm -hmm. This was kept quiet for 40 some years because the family was embarrassed. And finally, you know, the mom who is now in her, I, I, I guess, probably in her 70s, finally admitted to it. And um, the, the son flew from, from America to Italy to be reunited with his mom and had not seen her in 50 years. Wow, that's, that's, some, that's, some, that's unbelievable. And, yeah. you know, it, to this moment, it still makes me tear up because the weekend that he flew to Italy, the week that he flew to Italy is the week that my mom passed away. So as I was dealing with the loss of my mother, I was watching him reunite with his mother after 50 years. And so even though I was losing my mother, it made, it gave me an enormous amount of pride and happiness to be able to know that that moment in life was due to the research that I've done. That if I had never done this research, they would have never found each other. Because even, even the man's sister told me, you know, I tried to find her for 20 years and I was never able to find her. And so, you know, because of the research, I was able to reunite them. And it's just the timing of it, of, of, you know, me losing my mom and him regaining his just made it a lot easier for me. Wow, that's, that's yeah, that's an amazing story. And that, yeah, I could, I could just imagine how rewarding that is. Yeah. Whatever, whatever I do in life will not compare to that. There I will bet. be no comparison that I you, that I was able to bring that together, those two people together after 50 years and to be able to give him that sense of knowing who his family was. And yeah. now he's, you know, now he's learned about my research and now he's really into, you know, the family history and all of that. And so it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's been really good because I have a whole family now that I never realized that I had. 
Yeah. You know, yeah. I have a whole family in Italy that I had never knew I had. I visit with them often. I was just down when I was in Italy the last time I visited with cousins in Grisetto. I'm going back in a few weeks. I'll visit with them again. You know, if I plan on moving to um, to Florence at some point, I'll have a whole network of people there that I'm already friends with and I already know over through the research. And it's been wonderful. Well, you know, and that's and that's true of me. Me too. I don't think we're ever going to wind up living there, although I would if my wife would let me. But uh, but I've met so many great people over there. And, you know, we just had it. And we we didn't cancel because we we're afraid, but we cancel it more because of this whole thing that we have set up in various regions. And if they start closing regions, we're not going to be able to, yeah. to, to go, you know. Uh, so we just postponed again until next, next May with this wacky disease. But um, you know, I've met so many great people there and I'm dying to meet them and, you know, cousins that I never knew existed and they never knew I existed. They, they had no idea that they had, you know, family in America. No, oh. cl- no clue at all. No clue at all. Right. Yeah, and, and it's funny because now because of this friends of Letity thing that I'm doing, I, there's a, there's a family I'm friends with in town who own a restaurant. And now I just found out that and she didn't know this, but she's got cousins in France and America. So, you know, it, it's again, you, they, you know, because if, if somebody left Italy three generations ago, he, they're forgotten. They're completely forgotten. Right. So, if yes. yes. Like if somebody's great great grandparents left, they're gone. They've totally forgotten about because whoever remembered them is now dead. If a grandparent left, they remember it. But beyond grandparents, they don't even know that they've got family in America. Right. And, you know, and, and when I when I started, and there's one cousin in particular that's been helping me out. But when we started, you know, just, you know, sending pictures back and forth and you know, little artifacts with the with the crest on it and things like that, uh, they to your point earlier, they've learned stuff about their past and their family that that they didn't know. Yeah. So it's really funny. And they were in Italy. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's the th- my um, my Italian family had no clue of any of this past history. either. I mean, they knew a little bit more than I did because um, there's two branches. There's the Fatorosis and the Fatorosi de Barnabas and the Fatorosi de Barnabas are, you know, now considered nobility in Italy. So they're still trading on the, the Fatorosi de Barnabas name, but they didn't know that the Fatorosis were noble before the de Barnabas. Mm. They, they only thought that the family became noble in the 18th century. They didn't have any clue about all of this. You know, what one of the most satisfying things was, is I think I told my aunt before she passed away that we were related to St. Thomas Aquinas. And she was amazed. She was a very religious, very Catholic woman. She's like, you can trace our line to St. Thomas Aquinas. I said, well, yes. Um, there was a family that married into the Fatorosi family that, wa- that also married into the, the Aquino family, which is the St. Thomas Aquinas family. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's not a direct, it's not, but it's a cousin. So through a cousin, we can trace our, our way. And she just, you know, she was just so happy that she was related to a saint. Somehow she was related to a saint and she could die a happy woman. My, but one of my favorite grandfathers is uh, St. Arnulf. He's the patron saint of beer. Oh, really? <laughs> and he's, I'm direct from him. Oh, really? Uh, but I'm also direct from Pope Paul III. How? Uh, oh, because they had illegitimate children uh, 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 uh paul the yeah pope paul the third yeah yeah he had he had uh a couple and um what was funny was we were watching if you watch uh the borgias the, mm-hmm. the, the 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 uh hbo special there or uh, mm-hmm. whatever uh he, they, he's prominent in there mm-hmm. uh he's um uh, what's the family name? family name is funny say Oh, well, we may be related. We probably, I'm sure we may be. Well, no, because that, that's, some, that's something I've been trying to track down. Okay, this is the one area that I can't get to. So there was a Giovanni Battista Fatorosi, who was a attorney for the Roman Curia. And the Roman Curia is the, the, the you yeah, know what it is. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's the administration of the Vatican. The so big shots. Was, 
Yeah, he, he was a Pope's lawyer, which I always like to joke with people, is that my ancestor was a <laughs> Pope's lawyer. And so, and all of his records are in the Vatican archives, okay? One of his best friends uh, was a cardinal, and that cardinal was responsible for starting, Cardinal Diamulio was the cardinal responsible for starting the Vatican archives. And so um, all of his stuff is kept in the Vatican archives. I cannot get to see it. OK, because to, to do anything in the Vatican archives, you have to be a researcher that's being sent there by a university. You have to have insurance and you have to be uh, uh, you have to have a letter from a professor and then they review you to see if they'll let you into the archives. So there is all these papers from Giovanni Battista Federosi that are in the Vatican archives that I can't see. And one of the things that I think happened is that they married into the Farnese family. Like they, their daughters married a, a Farnese because they were also around the same time. And I'll have to look. Very, I'll have to look around because um, what, the, the, uh, Pope Alexander, the Borgia Pope. Yes. Um, he, uh, uh, his main squeeze was Julia Farnese, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Alessandro was mm -hmm. her brother, mm -hmm. and she, you know. The way they show, I mean, you know, you know how Hollywood plays with things, but the best I could figure out is she went to the Pope and say, hey, you know, you got to do something with my brother here. Mm -hmm. So he made him a cardinal when he was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. So that that the Borgia, the uh, Della Rovere was involved in that, all of that too. I have Della Rovere descendants. They were all at that same time. But eventually, uh, Alessandro became uh, Pope Paul Ooh. III. Yeah. And he had, uh, I think, two illegitimate sons, and I'm a direct from one of those illegitimate sons. Really? Yeah. And what year? What year are we talking about? Uh, we're talking. Um, he he became he became a cardinal, I think, in the late 1400s, and a pope pope in the 1500s. Hmm. So that would have been just slightly before my ancestor, because my ancestor was a Roman Curia attorney from about 1540 to about 1565. Yeah, so it's probably, yeah, probably just at the, the, the tail end. Yep. But, you know, his, uh, uh, Alessandro's sons was still, one of them was a card, I think one of them became a card, no, his nephew, his, I think two of his nephews, he made two of his nephews, I think, mm -hmm. uh, cardinals, a very, at least one, but I mm -hmm. think maybe two, I'll have to check. So it's very possible and they had kids. So, you know, <laughs> anything's well, possible. <laughs> I know. And, and it's funny because, because you, again, you do these, these jumps in, in logic because you have to sometimes because the puzzle pieces are missing. So at the same time that Giovanni Battista Fatorossi is a Roman Curia attorney is the same time when Michelangelo is finishing yes, right. the work right. on the dome of St. Peter's Basilica. And I just scratch my head and I go, I wonder if they ever talked. Because at that point, you know, now the Vatican's a huge, huge thing with, with, with thousands of employees and people in and out. But back then, there was maybe several hundred people that worked at the Vatican. It wasn't as big. And I'm just wondering, I just scratched my head and go, I wonder if Giovanni Battista kind of like walked through and waved at Michelangelo like, hey, nice. <laughs> looks, nice looks, <laughs> looks yeah, like it looks good. <laughs> Thumbs up. And you just wonder about these historical things, but there's no way to prove it. There's no way to know it. You just dream that, you know, that yeah. there was some type of interaction like that. And, and, and the other part of the whole Borgia thing was Lucretia Borgia. Us. Yeah. Uh, she, she had an affair with another one of my great grand, grandfathers. Wow. Uh, Francesco Gonzaga. Oh, Gonzaga. Yes. Yeah. So, and, and in the and in the show, they really they they do not. It pisses me off because they do not give this woman uh, any credibility. Isabella de Este, who is Francesco's uh, wife, who was like she was like the Jackie Kennedy of the 1500s. She was an amazing woman with the mm -hmm. arts and and all of this kind of stuff. And like and she ran really salons cool. too, right? She had salons. Uh, salons. You probably yeah. I mean, I'm not sure, but possibly. Um, but he, 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 Francesco wound up with syphilis, <laughs> probably thanks to Lucretia Borgia. 
<laughs> but again, you know, you need to put, you know, you put these things together. It's like, yeah, I mean, your your history is absolutely, uh, you know, astounding and amazing that you've been able to trace it back to so many uh, prominent people in history. And, and it, it all started with uh, my great grandfather's card. Oh yeah, I remember you seeing showing that on Facebook. Yeah. I remember that. Yes, it, it all started. It all started with that. Quite yeah, unfortunately, I don't have any royalty like that in my bloodline, but it's it's nice to know that. You know, I've been yeah, able, to- you know, there's millions of people who have these, you know, go back and people say, oh, you know, there's millions of people. I said, of course, I know that. I said, but being able to find it. Yeah, that's the interesting part. That's the, yeah. that's the amazing part. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, well, this has been this has been I can't tell you how much fun this has been. And so for the people listening, uh, what's the website? And what's the book? Where can they find the book? Well, the book is uh, Resurrection of the Scrolls. Uh, it's on Amazon.com. It's gotten really good reviews. People really like it. It's, it's a fun book. It's, it, <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a, the best compliment, I think, is I got Dan Brown Light. You know, if you like the Dan Brown series of books, you'll like this book, but it's not real heavy like Dan Brown's is. And you can read it in about eight hours. So if you're taking, or five hours, depending on how fast you read. So if you're taking like a cross country flight, you can read the book on one flight. And it, it, it's, it's interesting. And so I want to do book two, three. So each one of the, of the flashback chapters that you're noticing, they're going to be the next book. So right now I've got book number two, which is already outlined. I just have to start writing it. I have to find the time. And that's called um, Discovery of the Scrolls. So we go back to the very first moment when the scrolls are discovered and brought into Italy. And so then, then the next book will be the next background chapter. And then the final book will we'll jump into the future. So we'll find out what happens. That'll be the ending book of the book that you're reading now. Oh, we'll cool. jump 30 years into the future, but who knows how long that's going to take me to write five books. But or and if anybody is listening that they think that they have any relatives anywhere near Letteri, they can go to a website that I started called Archivio di Letteri dot com. Archivio, A-R-C-H-I-V-I-O, D-I, Letteri is spelled L-E-T-T-E-R-E dot com. And I'm going to have all of these records on for free up on the website for people to look at. So they can, you know, go through it and see if they can find any of their past relatives or past cousins or great grandparents or whoever it may be. Well, that's absolutely fantastic. And I really appreciate you taking the time. Sure. Anytime you want to have me back. I, I love these discussions. I can, you know, this is my passion. So I can talk about this for, for hours. So. All right. Well, we'll talk again. Definitely. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.